In the next video, I'll be showing you how to write your own functions. But before I do, I want to make sure that you understand exactly what a function is and how it can be called. In this video, I'm going to show you a number of built-in functions, functions that come with VB.NET. Some of these you've met before, and most of them are incredibly useful. I'm going to start by declaring and initialising a string variable. 27 pounds and 30 pence. The first function I'm going to show you is designed to get the length of a string. So I'm going to need an integer variable to store the result of the function. And here's the function call. i equals len st price. I'm using the len function. The result of the function is assigned to the variable i. So let's output the value of i. And we'll give it a go. The length of my string is 36 characters, including spaces. In this case, I fed the function a string as a string variable, but I could just as easily feed it a string in double quotes, like this. So the length of my name is 11 characters, including the space. Here's another function that gives us an integer. It's the ask function. I've given it the capital letter A, and it will give me back the ASCII code for the capital letter A. Let's comment these two lines out for now. The ASCII code for the capital letter A is 65. And for the letter B, it's 66. Here's a related function. It's the char function. This time I feed it an ASCII code and I get back the character which that ASCII code represents. So in this case, 66 is the ASCII code for the capital letter B. Here's another function which you came across in an earlier video. It's the isNumeric function. This function returns a Boolean value, either true or false, so I've declared a Boolean variable to hold its result. And here's the function call. isNumeric ST price. I'm asking the question, could the string inside ST price be converted into a number? And in this case, the answer is false. It's clearly a string which can't be turned into a number. But let's change the value of the string and see what we get. This value is still a string. It's still inside double quotes, and I'm still storing it into a string variable. But is numeric is returning true this time, because this particular string can be converted into a number. Is numeric doesn't actually do any conversion, it simply asks if it's possible. Let's take a look at a type conversion function. Perhaps not so obvious what's going on, but I'm actually taking the string 27.30 and turning it into a decimal value using the cdec function, which means convert to decimal. I've started with a string, but I've turned it into a decimal value, and that's what I'm actually outputting here. There are lots of similar data type conversion functions which I can choose from. C int, C double, C single, C date, C string, to name but a few. But there's one in particular which I can use to convert to any data type, and it's called the C type function. This time I'm giving the function two pieces of information the string which I want to convert into a number, and then the data type that I want to convert it into, in this case a decimal. This function has two parameters. This is the first parameter, 
and this is the second parameter. And I can use pretty much any data type as the second parameter. For instance, if I want to convert ST price into an integer value, I can do this. Or if I want to convert it into a double, I can do this. It's up to you whether you use cdeck or ctype. Needless to say, both of these functions would crash if the string st price can't be converted into a number. I have an invalid cast exception. I'll be talking more about these runtime errors in a later video. In the meantime, to prevent problems like this, I should really test whether it's possible to convert the string into a number before I attempt to do it. I've shown you this technique before. Another useful function is the format function. It works like this. I've used the format function to display the decimal value, deck price, as a currency. The pound sign is coming from the settings of my operating system. If your computer is set up to display currencies in dollars or euros or something else, then that's what you'll see when you format the value. Notice that the format function also takes two parameters. The second parameter is the style, and there are a number of different styles I can use. There's general number, fixed, standard, currency and percent. You can experiment with these yourself. Let's see some more string handling functions. The ukase function is taking my original string and converting it all into uppercase. The L case function converts it all into lowercase. This is the mid function. This function takes three parameters. I'm getting a substring starting at character position 9 and continuing for four characters. So I've got part of the word 7. Here's something similar. This time I'm getting four characters of the original string starting from the right. Notice that I need to qualify the name of the right function with the word strings. This is because the command write can be used in a different context. I won't go into that now. Here's another string handling function whose name also has to be qualified with strings. The replace function does exactly what its name suggests. In this case, I'm taking the original string st price and I'm replacing the capital P with a capital X. This is the instring function. Can you see what it's doing? It returns an integer which is the first position of the character which I specify. In this case, the first capital letter P occurs at character position 14. This is incredibly useful when it comes to parsing a string. 
something I'll talk about in a later video. I've shown you a few useful string handling functions, let me show you a few mathematical functions. There's a decimal value, perhaps it's somebody's weight in kilograms. Math.ceiling rounds a number up to the nearest integer. So I've started with 78.345, it's become 79. Math.floor will round a number down to the nearest integer. In this case it becomes 78. This is similar to the cint function. But the cint function will round the decimal to the nearest whole number. In this case, 78.345 is being rounded down. 78.678, on the other hand, is being rounded up. Arguably, math.floor and math.ceiling give you more control. Here's another rounding function. It's the math.round function. This time I've got two parameters. I can specify the number of decimal places. Math.pi is a function which doesn't take any parameters at all but it simply gives us the value of pi. And here's another function which doesn't require any parameters, but this one will return the system date and time. I'll talk more about dates and times in a separate video. Here's a function I've used in several previous videos. It's the input box function. I'm giving it one parameter here, which is a prompt, and when I run this particular function, it will display something on the screen. It's a function, nevertheless, and it does have a number of optional parameters. For example, I can include a title. I can include a default value. And I can specify exactly where on the screen I'll see the input box. As I say, these parameters are optional. It's not immediately obvious, but message box is also a function. The message box style parameter allows me to specify a combination of buttons to display. And what comes back from the function depends on which button the user selects. The button yes returns the number 6. The button no returns a 7. And the button cancel returns a 2. Here's a different combination of buttons. Abort is the number 3. Retry is 4. And Ignore is 5. Each button returns a unique integer value, which I can test. So, You've seen lots of different built-in functions to perform all kinds of jobs, and there are more. But what do they all have in common? Well, a function call has a typical structure. We have a variable equals, followed by the name of the function, 
and then the parameters that we want to pass to the function. Again, variable equals name of function parameters. That structure is typical of all of these function calls. In some cases, there's more than one parameter. But we always have something on the left of the function name. Every one of these functions returns a value, and that value has to go somewhere. We can also use a function within the condition of an if statement, like this. But notice there is still something to the left of the name of the function. In this case, the len function is returning its result directly to the condition part of an if statement. Here's another example. And here's another. Remember, the instring function returns the first position of the specified character within a string. If the character doesn't exist within the string, then it returns a zero. So here, I'm asking if the string st price actually contains a capital letter P. I can also nest function calls like this. So, I'm extracting a substring from the string st price, and then I'm converting it into uppercase. But as before, there is always something on the left of a function name. That typifies a function call. Here's another example of nested function calls. I'm typing my name in lowercase, and then I'm converting it immediately into uppercase. And you can have multiple levels of nesting. Let's suppose I want to generate a random number between 1 and 6. The rand function will generate a random number between 0 and 1. Needless to say, it's not an integer, it's a real number. To get a number between 1 and 6, I first have to multiply this by 6. And then, to make sure I don't end up with a number less than 1, I'm going to nest this inside math.ceiling. And finally, to make sure it's an integer, I'm going to nest this whole expression inside cint. a random number between 1 and 6. Now you know what functions look like and how they can be called, next time I'm going to show you how you can write your own functions.